to us and to our children. I was asking Janet uh, how much you already know about the way forward, and she said it depends on who you ask, on what they do. There have been some uh, materials made available to you, but why don't I go uh, as quickly as I can through a, a quick outline. Uh, first of all, wh what's going on? Why, how do we get to this place? Uh, it's been brewing for 50 years. It was in 1968 that uh, uh, we came together to form the United Methodist Church. You know that before that uh, we had been the Methodist Church, before that Methodist Episcopal Church down in the old building and that would have been on the, uh, on the cornerstone, the ME Church. Uh, First ME Church of Charleston. Um, and that itself was the result of a variety of splits. The Methodist movement uh, has been going for a couple of hundred years, but it has had many uh, divisions during that time. And so here in this country, the Methodist Episcopal Church split into Methodist Episcopal South and Methodist Episcopal over the issue of slavery. It split uh, into Methodist Episcopal and Methodist Protestant over how much uh, power bishops should have in, in determining things. And those three denominations came back together in, in 1939 to form the Methodist Church. And then in 1968, the Evangelical United Brethren Church, uh, which itself was a union of two former denominations, and the Methodist Church came together to form the United Methodist Church. And now we're facing the possibility of our becoming the untied Methodist Church. Uh, this is called the most serious crisis that we faced in, in the 50 years of our existence. What happened? Well, very early on, back there in 68, the, uh, as the Book of Discipline was being formatted, uh, a number of issues were being addressed. And in the social principles, the official stands of the church on the social issues of the day, um, it was decided to say two things about homosexuality in talking about in a larger section on human sexuality. First of all, it was said that homosexuals, no less than heterosexuals, are persons of sacred worth. And that their rights, as the rights of every human being, need to be protected, and that the church ought to take a lead in protecting the rights of homosexuals as well as heterosexuals. Nice, nice stand. But then in the same document, same paragraph, in fact, uh, the church said that uh, we do not condone the practice of homosexuality and consider this to be um, contrary or incompatible was the word that was used with Christian teaching. So, officially, this is where we were. Uh, homosexuals are persons of sacred right, uh, sacred worth, and they ought to have their rights protected, and the church ought to take a lead in protecting those rights. And yet, the practice of homosexuality is wrong. It's incompatible with Christian teaching, and uh, therefore we do not condone it. In general conferences since, and does everybody here understand how we're structured as United Methodist Church? Legislatively, and, and uh, do you 
uh, well, let's try it real quick here and see. The United Methodist Church, uh, well, the Methodist Episcopal Church, its predecessor, was formed in uh, the late 1780s. Um, and that was the time that the United States was forming its, uh, its governing. And the Methodists took the United States form of government and made it ours. We have a, a, a legislative branch, which is the General Conference, um, which meets every four years, made up of elected delegates. And those elected delegates uh, are half clergy, half of them clergy, half of them laity. They're elected by smaller uh, groupings, uh, annual conferences. Annual conferences elect their delegates to go to general conference. And also to jurisdictional conference. Jurisdictional conference is a smaller geographic area. We're in the North Central Jurisdictional Conference, which includes the Dakotas, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Ohio, uh, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, Iowa. Uh, we're in the North Central. And um, that group meets every four years, as General Conference does, to elect bishops. Like the, uh, the United States system, we have an executive uh, branch. It's the Council of Bishops. And like the United States, we have a, um, uh, a way of, of solving problems through the law, through someone to interpret the law. And that's our Supreme Court, which is called the Jurisdictional Council. Okay, so we're, we're kind of like... Hmm? The Judicial Council. Oh, Judicial Council. What did I say? Jurisdictional. This is my wife. <laughs> She spends a lot of time uh, correcting me. <laughs> they start with the same thing. Uh, yeah, judicial counsel. Thank you, darling. <laughs> I call her things like darling, honey, sweetie, so I don't have to remember her name. <laughs> Names are getting harder and harder for me all the time, seems like. But anyway, anyway, uh, judicial counsel, which is our Supreme Court. Okay. Back on topic. So the general conferences have been meeting every four years, and uh, uh, any United Methodist individual or group can uh, submit what they call petitions, which are suggestions for changes in the law or for new laws. And by and the rulings are, if a petition comes in, general conference has to um, consider it, which is going to be interesting because when general conference, the special general conference meets next month in St. Louis, they not only have the three plans that uh, three separate plans to consider, they have to choose between them. They also have a number of petitions that people have been sending in, um, which offer different ideas. And they're gonna have to consider every one of them during that week in St. Louis and come up with a, with a plan. So, um, other things that happened in general conferences since that first one uh, that, form, that formed the United Methodist Church, uh, we also had succeeding general conferences uh, decide that a self-avowed practicing homosexual could not be ordained as a minister and could not be appointed as a pastor. And then, later on, another general conference decided that um, um, homosexual weddings 
could not be performed in a United Methodist Church and could not be performed by a United Methodist minister. I tried to test that out at one point because I was invited by a lesbian couple who had lived together for many years to come have a prayer at their, um, at their wedding. And so uh, I asked the district superintendent, he said, oh, don't bother me with that, please ask the bishop. So I asked the bishop, and the bishop says, oh, why are you bringing this up now? I said, well, now, Bishop, it's not officially conducting a wedding. It's just having a prayer for a couple of friends. Surely we would pray even for our enemies. He said, please don't do this. He said, if you do it, uh, will it be in public? I said, well, yeah, it's in public. Will there be newspapers there? I said, well, there'll probably be cameras, uh, news cameras there. Oh, he said, please don't do this. <laughs> Um, interesting, interesting reactions um, because bishops haven't known quite what to do with it. Since then, there have been um, gay weddings done by pastors, and some of them have been kicked out of their ministry because of it. Others, nothing's happened. Even a bishop did a gay wedding for his son. His son was one of the uh, partners in the couple and uh, made no apology about it. There was a big brouhaha and uh, charges laid against the bishop to get rid of him. And the Judicial Council uh, finally said, well, they couldn't really find grounds for kicking him out at this point. And a lot of people got upset about that. Well, the grounds are there. The law says uh, in the Book of Discipline uh, that you can't do it. Now has come perhaps one of the greatest challenges of all in the Western jurisdiction. You know, California and all, all that territory way out there. They have elected a new bishop, Karen Olivieto. Um, very capable woman. She's been elected bishop and appointed to, uh, to be the bishop of uh, uh, a sizable area covering three states in the West. And she is a self-avowed lesbian living in a lesbian relationship long-term relationship and a number of people have um, demanded that the church uh, kick her out not only to remove her as a bishop and invalidate her consecration as a bishop but also to take away her orders as a as a minister and um, the judicial council said well that's correct. She has violated church law, but we do not think she ought to be taken out yet until all the um, appeal, uh, appeals in the appeal process have been finished. And so there are people on both sides of that issue on tenterhooks. But well, as you can tell, this is hot. I mean, this, this, this is a real uh, problem that we're facing. So at the last general conference, as has been at each general conference every four years since 1968, there have been um, demands for changing the stances of the United Methodist Church, Stance, uh, changing it both ways. Some have demanded that the church start implementing the rules we have. Kick Olivieto out, get rid of these ministers, um, make sure that none of this hanky-panky is going on. That's one side. And the other side is saying, hey, things are changing in the world. Attitudes toward homosexuality is changing. We're, we're learning new things about uh, human sexuality and the, the way that we're made. 
And the church needs to recognize this. We need to understand it and we need to come to terms with it. And so we ought to, to loosen those rules. We ought to take out these, these um, negative uh, statements out of the Book of Discipline. I've been a delegate to General Conference. And uh, it's a fascinating experience. You're sitting there among uh, 900 or so delegates from all over the world. And I remember one general conference where I was sitting right behind me was the delegation from Mexico. Right across the aisle was the delegation from Kenya. Um, and across the aisle on this side was a delegation from, uh, from um, where was it? Somewhere else in the world. <laughs> And you had headphones, and everything that was said was being translated simultaneously into nine different languages. A fascinating experience. And I remember talking with some of the African delegates, and they were very clear about it. They said, if the United Methodist Church changes its stance on homosexuality in the slightest, loosens it up in the slightest, there will be no more Methodism in Africa. And in Africa is where we're having our greatest growth. United Methodist Church is losing membership in the United States, but it's growing overseas, and particularly in Africa, it's exploding. Which means that the delegates, the number of delegates in the General Conference, they're changing. We have fewer um, Americans, more from other countries. And even in this country it's changing because we have um, the greatest loss in our denomination has been in the eastern, northeastern, the north central, and the western jurisdictions. We've had less loss and even some growth in the South Central, Texas and such, Texas, Oklahoma, Arizona, okay. and Southeastern, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and so forth and so on, which tend to be more conservative by and large than the rest of the country. So it's been, there have been some interesting sea changes going on in the, the makeup of the General Conference delegates. Well, so much for background like that. Um, at the last General Conference, the delegates were deadlocked. They were arguing. It was hot and bitter as it is every four years. And they finally asked the Council of Bishops uh, to do something that was unprecedented. You see, they, the bishops are present at General Conference, but they don't have a vote. And they don't have voice unless General Conference grants it. They're to sit there with their mouth shut, listening to what goes on. Except every session, legislative session, is chaired by a bishop. And they asked, can the bishop step in and help us break the deadlock, help us with a way forward? The bishops met very quickly and came back and said, we think we ought to stop talking about it. Let's not talk about it anymore right here. Instead, let's, um, let's uh, appoint a commission to study the issue and have a special general conference uh, in 2019. And a regular general conference will happen in 2020. Uh, a commission was formed of 32 people uh, drawn from across the world, different viewpoints, and those 32 have been meeting, and they came up with three plans. And 
and that's what the general conference is focusing on as much as as anything these three plans and you've got papers on those three plans um, what they are first of all there's the um, traditionalist plan which simply um, says the things that we say in the discipline we're going to keep those against homosexuality but uh, the practice of homosexuality but retain the rights of homosexuals um, we will not allow a homosexual to be a minister in our church and uh, we will not allow gay weddings to be done in our churches and this plan says we need to strengthen the language and strengthen the the um, the structure so that those rules will be followed no more wishy-washy they're going to be followed they're going to be put and if you don't like it get out you know bye-bye find another church where you'll be happy because you ain't going to be happy with us out um, we're going to be we're going to finally do what we say we believe traditionalist plan on the other side of it is the um, connectional conference plan which says let's create three jurisdictions no longer based on geography but based on ideology and so there will be one jurisdiction spread across the denomination of churches uh, and clergy and people who um, believe the traditionalist way and those churches those clergy would not do gay weddings and so forth another uh, uh, jurisdiction would be um, much more progressive liberal whatever term you want to put on it it would get rid of the language that homosexuality is not compatible with Christian teaching it would get rid of the notion that you can't have gay weddings can't have gay clergy it's going to be just the opposite and those churches and those pastors who believe that way can be in this group and then there will be a third jurisdiction it will be kind of in between kind of like the way we are now let's let's just kind of maybe not talk so much about it let's let's can't we just all get along <laughs> sort of thing um, so that's um, that's that second plan the third plan is supported by the majority of the United States bishops but tellingly enough not by the bishops overseas and by some of the southern bishops in this country um, but the the third plan is the one that the majority of bishops are pushing most of all and that'll be um, kind of an in-between sort of thing an in-between sort of thing yeah so um, the as Bishop Scott Jones says this this third plan called the one church plan will give conferences churches and pastors the flexibility to do what they feel is their call to do what they feel is best without disbanding the connectional nature of the church it would remove the language from the book of discipline that restricts pastors and churches from conducting same-sex weddings would remove the language that restricts annual conferences from ordaining self-avowed practicing homosexuals it would affirm sexual relations only within the covenant of monogamous marriage between two adults 
not between a man and a woman, but between two adults. And local churches then would have the freedom to decide whether they allow same-sex marriages in their church. If uh, this church wouldn't allow it, well, they can go over to another United Methodist Church that would. If this pastor doesn't want to do it, well, find another pastor who would be willing to do it. So it tries to give as much flexibility as, as possible. And annual conferences would have the freedom to decide whether or not to ordain practicing lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, uh, transgendered, and queer persons. Um, those are the three kinds of plans. Before I go on, let me just stop. I'm throwing a lot of stuff out at the same time. Um, wh what kinds of questions do you have? Am I going too fast? Am I too, yeah. I used to have a question about this. Do you want to go to a microphone so everybody can hear you? Uh, I think these mics are all on, are they? My question is on the last plan. Uh -huh. Is it up to the individual churches, or is it the district, or a conference? It'll be up In other to words, the, is the decision going to be made at a higher level as to whether or not this area is going to go with that plan. It's it's up to the individual church, as I understand it. Church, okay. That would. Um, so that you'll have congregations that can decide different ways on it, but still be United Methodist. Okay, but at a higher up level, do we? Does somebody else decide if our district is going to adopt that plan? No, uh, it would uh, it would leave that very vague, I think, and it would um, it's, it's trying to give as much freedom as possible. Um, uh, what what it means? Now I've been a district superintendent involved in the appointment process. It would mean that as district superintendent, I would have been going to a church, trying to find out what those people want to have happen. And then I'd try to match up a pastor who would agree with that. Okay. Um, so if this church decides it doesn't want to allow homosexual weddings, i try to make sure I send a pastor there who doesn't do homosexual weddings. You know, you try to handle it that way. Okay. So it wouldn't be at the district level, for instance, um, a northern Illinois district would decide to go to say, yes, we will allow homosexual ministers and gay marriages, but well, the farther I, south district would say, no, our district is not going to do that. that, that it, it will be up to annual conferences to decide whether they ordain homosexuals or not. And my guess is Northern Illinois would say, yes, we will ordain homosexual ministers. People who don't like that, what do they do? I mean, you know... Um, on the local level, they wouldn't be forced to do homosexual weddings or have a homosexual pastor, is what they're hoping to do there. And the opposite of that, if that district or the conference said, we're not going to allow it, the individual church would not be able to vote to say, we want to have that? Yeah, and the understanding is that if people in that church don't like what the majority think, they need to go to another United Methodist Church that thinks the other way. But it's not just up to the annual conference. I mean, churches within the annual conference can have various practices. Oh, yeah. But it's up to the annual conference to decide who they will ordain. Right. Yeah, that's an ordination is always a decision by an annual conference. So, He's grabbing a mic here. So. Ah, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions? Yes, sir. My question is, is what does the Bible say about homosexuality? What does the Bible say? Oh, I'm so glad you got around to that. It just so happens 
You have your Bibles? Everybody have a Bible? We need to look at five different sets of scriptures. Um, let's talk about, first of all, um, Genesis 19, verses 4 to 11. Genesis 19, 4 to 11. It's about the sin of Sodom, the city of Sodom. And what was the sin of, of the city of Sodom as you read that scripture there? What was the sin? You find it? What was the sin that they did? Wickedly. Yeah, what did they what was their sin, their wickedness? Well, the sin to me there is that he gave him the daughters. <laughs> that's, oh, yeah. that's aside from your, your point. Okay, the men wanted to have these strangers sent out of the house so that they could whatever with them. Um, now, progressives uh, in their theology say the sin was the sin of inhospitality. Hospitality is a crucial concept in the in the Near East. Um, if your worst enemy came to your house asking for shelter, you had to take him in, feed him, let him sleep there for three days and nights. Absolutely. Now, on the fourth morning, you could cut his throat. <laughs> But for three days, you had to offer hospitality. Hospitality was, was the main thing. And so progressives say, well, the sin of Sodom was that they weren't hospitable. But traditionally, the sin of Sodom was that they wanted these men come out so they could have homosexual relations with them. And so the sin of sodomy through the ages has been considered homosexuality. Um, in the seventh chapter of Jude in the New Testament, it refers back to that and talks about the sin of Sodom. Okay, let's take a look at another passage. Um, Leviticus, Old Testament. Leviticus um, 18 verse 22 and if you want to look at a parallel passage chapter 20 verse 13 this is part of what's known as the holiness code uh, the law of Moses the law given by God to Moses and what does it say there What was the numbers? Uh, Leviticus 18, verse 22. I believe I'm right on that. It says you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. How far do you go? Just 22. Well, that, no, that's, that's fine. If uh, a man lies with a man as with a woman, it is an abomination unto the Lord. And um, they shall both be executed. You shall kill them. Now the Holiness Code has another a number of things for which you need to execute people. Uh, for instance, uh, if a child talks back to his parent, kill him. It's the law of God. If they talk back, our four kids, neither one of them, uh, none of them would have made it to adulthood. <laughs> rotten kids, you know. Somebody asked me, why, why uh, asked me here, while well, I was here as pastor, why is it that preachers' kids are so ornery? I said, because they only have lay people's kids to play with. 
and they, they pick up bad habits, you know. Okay, all right. Okay, so the Holiness Code has a number of things that are sanctioned so that um, um, execution is the remedy. And homosexuality, a man lying with another man as with... It doesn't say anything about a woman lying with a woman, but there are other... That's on other lists. Um, St. Paul had a list of sins. 1 Corinthians, New Testament, 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. For some of you to look up. And uh, others, if you want to, 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. Paul has a list of sins there in those two passages. And what are they? 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, and robbers. Okay. So, sodomites, there's that word pointing back to the sin of Sodom. Uh, homosexuals. They should be treated like drunkards. Greedy. And uh, those who are greedy. And what, what should be done with them? It says none of them will inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. They're all going to hell. <laughs> right? If you're yeah. going to speak, could you somebody just stand and we'll bring you a microphone? Because we are recording this. We're, we're recording this, so if you want to speak, please put up your hand. They'll bring you a microphone, okay? Or come to one of the microphones. Okay, so um, um, for this sin, it doesn't say you should kill them, but God's going to take care of it in the afterlife. Okay, that's uh, the third set. Does 1 Timothy say anything different? Somebody looked up 1 Timothy? 1 Timothy what? Uh, chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. We need a microphone. What's it say there? This means understanding that the law is laid down not for the innocent, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the godless and sinful, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their father or mother, mother for murderers, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. Okay. So you can go to hell for lying as much as anything else, huh? Some of us are in trouble. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. But sodomites, again, was there. That's, that's the word. The final, um, well, the final passage, no, next to final passage. Uh, Romans 1, verses 24 to 27. This one is the uh, passage that is most often quoted by, uh, by people in this debate. Romans 1, 24 to 27. Somebody have that? Need a microphone? Hold up your hand if you have, if you found it. Got it? There we go. I'm sorry. That's okay. Sorry. What am I reading? Where is it? Romans, <laughs> Romans 1, 24 to 27. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Continue. 
Sure. For this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. And in the same way, also the men, giving up natural intercourse with women, were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind into things that should not be done. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetedness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious toward parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. Yet they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Uh, what do you hear in that passage? What, what do you What do you hear there that's interesting? That's somewhat different, in fact. Different from the other passages you've read. What do you hear there? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think it's that... It microphone, microphone. <laughs> it isn't that uh, it's something that you're born with. They're saying they just decided to do these practices, which is contrary to what we know today. Okay, okay. Anything else you notice there? I think they're blaming everything bad on those people. Yeah, um, because they are homosexual, therefore they are doing all these terrible things. Lying, murdering, stealing, and so forth and so on. That's, that's an interesting take on it. But how do you become homosexual in the first place? Does this passage give any light on that? Uh-huh. Since God... Uh, microphone. <laughs> So I think um, just one thing that's fair to say is that we really don't know the they that that passage is referring to. I don't know who the they is from those verses that were just read. Who is that they? And can we attribute to them all these negative things that are being listed out? And is that really fair for us to say, well, this means that people who are this way have all these consequences, undoubtedly, because Paul listed them in a list of things uh, that are for an unclear group of people that we don't know who they are. So that's what I see in that passage. Okay, that's one of the one of the great objections that people have to this passage that are being used. Yeah. Um, well, it says... Uh, God gave them. God gave them up for for these passions. Interestingly enough, yeah. If they're homosexuals, God has made them this way, and therefore, as a result, they they do all these terrible, terrible things. They murder. Yes. I just think um, that it talks about it in the very in 26. The very first and most important thing I see in that is that they had passions for the creature rather than the creator. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that that is lifted up by a number of people who use this passage. Um, uh, for instance, C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest Christian thinkers of the 20th century said that he felt that um, in homosexuality you were worshiping yourself. You were worshiping someone like you. You were worshiping yourself and not God. Yeah, thank you for that insight. Anybody else? I, I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, we've heard what Moses had to say. We've heard what Paul had to say. What did Jesus say? Ah, thank you. Thank you. What did Jesus have to say about homosexuality? Anybody know? Nothing. nothing. Oh, nothing. Nothing. Well, except, uh, not, not quite, but except. Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6. Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6. 
What does Jesus say? Anybody have it? Anybody have a microphone? Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6. Or if you want to, take a look at Mark 10, 5 to 9. He answered, Have you not read that the one who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? Okay. It was over the question of divorce, right? As you look at that passage, uh, uh, Moses said that uh, you can be divorced. What do you say, Jesus? And Jesus says, well, uh, yeah, it's there in the law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what? That wasn't God's intention from the beginning. God's intention was that a man would leave his father and mother and be joined with his wife and they would become one flesh. That's what God really wanted. Um, it's an anti-divorce passage. Um, it was what it was about. But there are some people who have picked that up and said, well, Jesus was really interested in making sure you knew marriage should be between a man and a woman. Not between two men and not between two women. Uh, others say, well, that's, that's pushing that passage a little far. But anyway, yes, ma'am. Reverend Palmer, I'd like to get us back on track here with the plans. Yeah. And could you please describe what the second plan would do if a local congregation has a pastor that no longer is consistent with what the congregation wants? Oh. Well, it's exactly what we would, all three plans, I think, would handle that the same way. It's the way we handle it now. If you have a pastor who's really out of step with the congregation, you have a staff parish relations committee that is supposed to call up the district superintendent and say, we've got to talk. We have a problem here. And... Um, um, talk it over with the staff uh, parish relations committee and the district superintendent. Superintendent will take it back to the cabinet, that is the bishop, with the other district superintendents of that conference, and will say, hey, I've got a problem in Charleston. Uh, the pastor is at cross purposes with the church. His theology, his practices are really not in line with what that church wants. This thing is not working well. We need a change. And so there's a change. Remember, every pastor is appointed for one year only. One year at a time. And may be moved even during that year if necessary. So that, uh, well, it's like me. I served uh, as an active pastor 42 years. And I couldn't hold a steady job anywhere. <laughs> I just kept moving. Yes, sir. That's really no different than the way it is now, is it? That's right. D do you envision ever having uh, congregations that are identified by their cross and flame or something like that, like the Missouri Senate in the, Uther in the Lutheran Church? where if we took, I think it would be the third option, where different congregations could essentially decide for themselves who they want to be. So you're driving down the street and you want to go to a Methodist church and you go, uh-oh, they've got the blue cross, I'm not going there. i got to go to the red cross. Do you envision something like that or has that ever been discussed? Well, it's not what I envision, it's what the plan envisions. Yeah. I'm sure they're going to talk about that a lot. Branding, essentially, I guess. Yeah, they're going to talk about that a lot. Um, how are we doing on time? We're getting close. Getting close? I've got one to bring up for us, Tom. Okay. 
several years ago, matter of fact, it was when Terry Clark was our pastor here, Roy, you might remember this, that our men's group, our morning breakfast group, studied a book called Resident Aliens. It was written by two United Methodist bishops, Will Williman and uh, a guy named Hauerwas. Can't remember his first name. Huh? I don't know what, I don't remember why I can't remember his first name. Stanley Hauerwas was um, a seminary professor, yes, yes, not a bishop. Yeah, he wasn't a bishop. Uh -huh. yeah. In the book, Resident Aliens, it says that we, as Christians, as followers of Christ, we set ourselves apart from the rest of the world and worldly things. And every year, things come up that are popular subjects or political influences that tear down a portion of the wall that we stand for. How do you address this theory compared to what we're doing today? Because well, in a lot of ways, that's how a lot of us are feeling, is that what we have believed in from what we <laughs> have felt for years is being torn down. Yeah. Um, and I say that with a lot of love and sure. to all of us. I think it's happening to all of us, all of us, well, at least everybody I've talked to, we feel very torn by this. The church we, we love is tearing itself apart over this. What's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. I don't think that the so-called progressive plan, I don't think it has a chance, uh, given the makeup of the General Conference delegates. I think it's entirely possible that the traditional plan will, will pass, given the makeup of the delegates. Or given the fact that the U.S. bishops are pushing that middle plan so hard, that, that one may win. Um, I don't know what all the other petitions say that have come in, but my guess is it'll be one of these three plans, and my guess is it'll be either the traditionalist or the, the, middle, the middle of the road one. But I also think that whichever plan is chosen, there's going to be a sizable exodus from the church. Already, some of the major pastors of some of the largest churches in the United States have announced that if the traditional plan is not the one chosen, they will leave the denomination and try to take their congregation with them. Um, some on the other end of the spectrum, the progressives, have said the same thing, that uh, uh, we, there will be no place for us. We'll leave. It's a matter of conscience. I, I, the, the Board of Pensions has indicated that uh, if, they, if a plan is chosen that's going to take a lot of changes in the Book of Discipline, well, it may really tear our pension program apart, and that's going to be kind of disastrous. Um, what's going to happen? We don't know. I think we all, uh, we each have some convictions on this issue of homosexuality. And I hope you've not heard me try to take a stand one way or the other. If you want to after this, I'll be glad to tell you about my feelings, but uh, that's neither here nor there. That's not why I'm here. Uh, I think we all have convictions about our church. And we've all known through the ages the church has always had to put people of different opinions together never had a church where everybody thought exactly alike. Never. In fact, I've served churches where 
if only one member was left, he wouldn't think exactly alike with himself. <laughs> you know. But we see our beloved church tearing itself apart. It's been going on for 50 years. Uh, what will happen now? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, I'm, it just struck me that as we consider where to go, we're focusing on passages in the Bible. Um, we're being very selective about these passages, and I don't know that's very constructive, because we can go to other passages and look at maybe, for instance, Genesis, where it was stated that God created mankind in his image. And by mankind, we're talking about people who are white, black, brown, people with disabilities, people who are straight, people who are you know LGBTQ. And so why aren't we focusing on that? Why aren't we focusing on Jesus' command to love God and to love our neighbors ourselves and I would just like people to ponder that don't get hung up on those few passages that were written by people within certain historical contexts thank you mm -hmm. that's a very helpful um, yeah absolutely the, the 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 whole thrust particularly the Gospels is that we are one in Christ right uh, Galatians for you are neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, but you are one in Christ. <laughs> now that's the passage I really prefer. Yeah, very well done. Are we, oh, he wants to do, he wants to do something religious now. So will the ushers come forward with the plates? Uh, it's the one thing we do religiously. Will you, uh, before we go, I know we might be running a little close to time. Would you thank Reverend Palmer with me? I want to thank you for coming. I always say uh, when I, no matter what church I serve and no matter where I am the pastor, I just stand in a line. And uh, when I talk about Wesley Church, I talk about standing in a line of outstanding pastors. And Miley Palmer, you have personified that for us today. So thank you. And... Uh, Thank you, Janet, for your faithfulness. I know how that works. And um, there was something else. Oh, I was going to say this. When I grow up, I want to be able to explain things as well as you do. So I'm going to work on that. Um, Today has been a really good segue, perhaps, into the study that I'll be doing for the four Sundays of January, Living Faithfully, Human Sexuality in the United Methodist Church. It's a four-week, it's supposed to be a small group study. I don't know how small the group will be, um, but I would encourage you, if you want to be a part of it, uh, to sign up. I would love to have you. It's going to be during the Sunday School Hour in this room, and I was going to say a little bit more, but it's time to worship. So, you all are staying for worship, right? That's the religious thing we do next. All right. While you're talking about books, while you're talking about books, let me... I think they turned you off. Oh. Stan wanted to do that to me often. Yes. Um, there's a brand new book out by a man named Dale McConkie, who's an Illinois boy, has a, a degree from U of I, called United Methodist Divided. It's the best thing I've seen come out so far uh, on, on what we're talking about. So United Methodist Divided, Dale McConkie. I ordered it and got it the next day. So they're sending them out in a hurry. In the meantime, then, are we done? We're done. Well, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.